Good afternoon. This is Andrew Sheets with The Third Heaven Traveler. The Third Heaven Traveler is a blog about our spiritual life in Jesus Christ and Him in us who believe on Him and how we apply this existence in our daily lives in this world. We are in this world, but we certainly are not of it. And that's the battle. The gospel is found in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 1 through 4, King James Bible. We are saved if we believe Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. Amen. The title of this study is a case study on the Hesiah age trap. Dear Lord, I thank you for this opportunity. I pray, Lord, that eyes could be opened. Even so, come, Lord Jesus. Amen. Maranatha. We are, as I said, in this world. So the Lord puts us in places and positions where we have to always be ready to give an answer. And we're constantly approached in manners of this nature. In 1 Peter chapter 3, 15, it is written, but sanctify the Lord God in your hearts and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you in a reason of hope that is in you with meekness and fear. Second Timothy chapter 2.15, of course we know we're to study, and that's hard work, right? To show ourselves, to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Now, that rightly dividing is continually perverted by the hyper-dispensationalists. It's not Romans to Philemon only, listeners. Yes, we have dispensations. It's in my study. Please read Hearing and Reading in the Study of the King James Bible. Also, in Defending the Faith, I have a very good study here. The final authority of the King James Bible, never bring a knife to a theological gunfight. We, not only do we battle the Laodicean church, the fake Christians that walk around carrying a Christian name tag and their preachers and teachers and the wicked wolves that have crept into the church, but we also have the lost world. Many don't care to even have a skirmish with the believers. They just will sit there and mock us privately or maybe say, shoot, a, make a comment and move on. But there are those wicked atheists and agnostics who, because their daddy is the devil, just like the rest of them, they are compelled to go attack doctrine, the Bible. Of course, they always go after the Bible. And even the wicked, lost, very evil wolves that are fake pastors using perverted Bible translations, they're even more evil because they come across as what? Christians, men of God, women of God, but they're not. But we have those who are openly atheist and agnostic. They attack, they hate the word of God. Their whole purpose, because the devil is driving them, you have to understand, they work and live for the devil. They are possessed. And they want to attack that to take as many to hell with them. I repeat, their whole goal and purpose is to attack, attack, because they want to sow seeds of discord, sow seeds of doubt where others doubt the Bible, the authority of especially the King James Bible, because they want to bring as many to hell along with them. They don't want to go to hell by themselves. So this morning, I received the following question on my Quora and account, and this is a perfect case study. This is why uh, the Lord pressed this on my heart to bring this up and make a video. Now, I'm almost finished with my part four of my Messianic Psalms, 
and, and how essential the Messianic Psalms are to our faith. And I'm really wanting to finish that, but the Lord pressed me, now get this out, and I hope this helps the saints. So I got this uh, question, and this is a great case study because it shows how the enemy and is able to attack the prey and, and prey upon feeble-minded and or those carnal Christians that don't read their King James Bible. You're gonna get eaten alive, people. You're gonna get chewed up if you're not armed with what? The full armor of God. Let's go through it quickly. What's your sword? The sword is an offensive weapon. It's two-edged sword. It's also defensive. That is the word of God in the final authority of the King James Bible. It's sharper than two edge, any edge sword, right? It cuts, it splits asunder the spirit from soul, discerner of the heart's intentions of man, right? Without the sword, you're unable to defend yourself and you're gonna get chewed up and you better understand it and study it. Now we have, of course, the shield of faith, because if our faith is not ground in what? The word of God doctrine, then we're gonna be bounced and we won't even stand sure and we're gonna get attacked and destroyed. We have, of course, our breastplate of our righteousness. That's not our righteousness. We stand, our inheritance is our justification and it is the righteousness of Christ. And we have the, our loins are girded with truth. That's Jesus Christ. That's our lower body extremities, right? And our legs. We have, of course, we have our feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace and we have the helmet of salvation. That means a headshot will kill the enemy and will kill our enemies and will kill us if we do not know and are secure in our salvation. If we doubt our salvation, if we think, oh, well, you can lose your salvation, then you have no helmet of salvation. So once we're armed, and this is focusing on using the word of God to combat these evil reprobates. So this is my core channel link. This uh, reprobate said, hey, how was Isaiah both 22, and this is years of age, right? 22 and 42 years old when he began to rule over Jerusalem, according to 2 Kings chapter 8, 26 and 2 Chronicles chapter 22, verse 2. Now, before I give you my response to, to expose this fool, I want to tell you what happens. Let's say you don't read your King James Bible. Let's say you're just, uh, well, um. Uh, I don't know. I didn't even know there was a problem there. And uh, let's say you just go online, go click, click, click. Let's see. Um, uh, let's see. What does it say? Well, it's going to give you a very confused mess. First of all, online, and I searched several. Uh, you're going to see this very often. Oh, it's a copyist error. The, they find that the man, Hebrew manuscripts had n n numerical mistakes, like they made a mistake between the number 22 and 42. And then other scholars say that there's another explanations here. And one of them, now, bingo, this one's getting pretty close talking about it does not refer to his personal age. Oh, we're on something there. Uh, this one here is saying, oh no, this is a contextual interpretation. Uh, some suggest the age of 42 could be symbolic. <laughs> what? Uh, others say, no, it's the age of his, that's how old his mother was. Now, in, 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 in one of my King James study Bibles, now check this out. Watch this. It shows, this is what, I'm going to quote the reference, and I'm talking the commentary in one of my King James study Bibles. Now, I don't have the 1900 Schofield, which is wicked, in that commentary I'm talking about of Schofield. But I just have a regular, uh, my work Bible I use is this, uh, let's see, I don't have, it's so worn here on the cover. But anyway, it's got some commentary and I use this, why? Because if I need a quick reference for context, I will get that for a contextual reference. But of course I check it. Now, this is what it says. Under 2 Chronicles chapter 22, it says, scholars agree 
that it seems likely the difference is a copy editing error. But it's a minor discrepancy, but it's often cited as evidence that the Bible, especially the Old Testament, is unreliable. And then they, which puts what? A seed of doubt, a seed of doubt. So the person, if you're not well-armed in God's word, you're gonna say, ah, man, I don't know. You know, whatever, it was a mistake. It, it, the, some, some old men wrote the Bible. Yeah, of course there might be mistakes. There you go, you're done. The enemy's already got you. Then the commentary follows blah, 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 blah about the Dead Sea Scrolls, about the manuscripts. It's a doctrine of demons. Now, the dynasty, the dynastetic reference, referring to the uh, Omri dynasty, this is what this one here, when that's looked up, this one here, let's check it. Let's go in here. And here are the references. One of them is even the King James today gives you the some references that will might lead you astray. This is read, lead you astray. This is why we have to study it. So when we open it up and really lay it out, we find here that this question this man is asking, it's an old, worn out, just a retread. It's just a trap. It's a tempt to get people to think and question the Old Testament. It's full of copyist errors, right? Copyist errors, they call it. And it's really quite humorous. But if one goes in to the actual King James Bible and opens it, now let's open it and actually read it. One discovers there's, guess what? An extreme difference in context. Yeah, let's examine it. When you go in, open with me the book of Kings, 2 Kings chapter 8, 26. When you read this scripture, it's clear. You're talking about how old was Isaiah? Isaiah, when he assumed, uh, when he assumed the kingship, 22 years of age. So we know he was 22 years old. But when we go to 2 Chronicles, chapter 22, verse two, we see that King Isaiah here, we see that it's not referring to him, but the Omri dynasty, you know, now this came through his mother. We see that this is talking about uh, the time would have been 42 years when he began, when Isaiah began to reign, right? And then it notes that it had been one year into his reign here. When his reign began, this was one year when this 42 years was reached. So, uh, so we have to know that the key, when we see this, here's our clue. Look at 2 Chronicles chapter 22, verse 1. If you look at the last sentence that pre precedes verse 2, we're talking about the dynasty here. All right? Now, so I wanted to take this further. And I said, yeah, it's very clear. I opened it up and read it. Yeah, one's talking about the dynasty. One is talking about his age, purely looking at his age. So I went and looked it up. Now, this took some time because when we do good, solid Bible hermeneutics, what is it? Remember, context. Next is the exegesis. That's breaking down the grammar, the vocabulary understanding the grammar and vocabulary in the context that's presented, right? This also has to include historical, what's going on, the background information. That also is important, right? Then we go in and compare scripture with scripture. So when we look at the actual time frame, we go to Bible archaeology. I use like three different sources. I use Bible, Bible archaeology, which they're a mess when it comes to theology and doctrine, but their historical research is pretty good. So let's look at this Omri dynasty. So we see Omri, six years. We know that Ahab, King Ahab was 22 years, and then Isaiah, uh, two years. 
When, when Obed, uh, Second Chronicles chapter 22, verse 2 was written, he was a year into that two years. And then we see Jerome's 12 years. At that point, that's looking at a 42-year reign. Now, that was the time frame that included his mother's or up to his mother's reign. So the key in carefully reading Second Chronicles chapter 22, verse 1, is especially important if we when we read the last sentence that precedes verse 2 right we know we're talking about dynasty so when we know we're talking about dynasty i went in i used a couple three references i used that uh, bible archaeology um, i used answers in genesis i looked at uh, I just put a search in there. and But yeah, you can lay out the Amri dynasty and it comes out and matches 42 years. Now the total time of the Amri dynasty, uh, dynasty, I'm sorry, was a uh, little over 50 years. Uh, some, I look at it, some says 54, 52 years, but it was at the 42 year mark when King Azariah came into power uh, at, at the point if he'd finished his first year. So anyway, so no, there's not a discrepancy in scripture. One's talking age, which is 2 Kings 8, 26, 2 Chronicles chapter 22, that's talking about the dynasty, time of the dynasty at that point in time of that Amri dynasty. Okay, enough. So here's his response. You play the old switcheroo apologetic. Here's an example. Now, I'm going to read this mumbo jumbo. Watch how wicked these people are. He says, I arbitrarily transformed the text to conform to my beliefs. This is called eisegesis. Well, I think he meant exegesis. Okay, maybe that's eisegesis is some form of that spelling, I don't know. They are so familiar with this trickery, they often don't know they're doing it, okay? Christians magically transform a particular verse with a textual switcheroo Bible fiddle, which works as follows. The textual switcheroo Bible fiddle, problematic Bible text, uh, so he's gonna give us some examples uh, here we have Matthew 19, 12 about the eunuchs. They made themselves eunuchs for the kingdom of heaven's sake. And uh, I don't know what uh, some, he's mixing up uh, perverted translations with King James here. He says, they take any problematic words you don't happen to like and you substitute them with words you happen to like better. Weaker Christians typically are offended at Jesus saying it's acceptable, though not mandatory, to self-mutilate your genitalia for the kingdom. Now, the sanitized Bible text, instead of saying eunuchs, make themselves eunuchs, they say there are celibates. They have made themselves celibates for the kingdom of heaven's sake. So, I don't know exactly, he doesn't say what translation he's using, but what they're doing, you see how the enemy will take against us, they will say, you Christians, you have all these Bible translations, look at this translation, it says this. You see how the devil works. He works within the church to teach wrong doctrine out of a perverted Bible translation, then you have the atheist agnostics, the lost out there. Well, they're both, they're all lost. The Laodicean church is just as lost. But then you have the outsiders who don't even openly proclaim their, the antithesis of Christianity out there, who will point and say, look at all these different translations. You don't know what you want. You, you don't want to say eunuch, so you say celibate. Then it says, Jesus was not particularly inspired by the Holy Spirit on the day he said it's acceptable to cut off your nuts for him. Modern Christians know better than Jesus can rework. And uh, he said into something else, 
that he didn't say, but he really should have said, blah, blah, blah. So who's got the mumbo jumbo here? Who is doing the switcheroo, the problematic Bible text? This man is rambling, and I don't know, it almost looks like he's just plugging in some language for uh, into AI or something. But now, so anyway, at this point, it's useless to keep going on with him, to say, oh, you don't understand, you're using perverted Bible compared to the King James. Uh, at this point, we have to be wise. We have to stop here. We know, and this is what I want to finish this study with here, we know that in 1 Peter 3.15, we are to always be ready to give an answer to every man. All right, I answered him. I answered him. Basically, no, what you see as a discrepancy is not. You're mixing apples and oranges. Your context. One context is about his age. The other is about the length of the dynasty. So now I move on and he's, oh, yeah, well, let me tell you, your Bible translate, da, 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 not even related. So here's what we have to do. We have to close this fool out and shut him down. So then I write, good try with your smoke and mirror parlor trick. No, I spoke clearly with a few words. I pray you repent and just boom, we're done. Move on. Now, you can't make this up. The, last night, I got another request Someone asked me, hey, how should we respond to a mocker or someone who's scorning, uh, you know, a scorner or a mocker? And I'm like, wow, this fits perfectly because this is what I'm doing. So we have to know when and how to respond. Remember this, always use the word of God. That's what Jesus did with the devil when he was tempted 40 days, right, and 40 nights that Jesus always came back with the word. Thus it is written, it is written, it is written. We need to do the same thing. Number two, always know that we have the word of God. Well, what word of God? There's only one final authority, use the King James. Because just as this atheist or agnostic, just as he pointed out, this translation says this, this says that, you see this, we have to have one final authority. In other words, uh, make sure you have the right equipment. It's like going into battle with the sword, make sure you have the right sword. Now, if someone is asking ridiculous, mocking rhetorical questions, trying to trap or embarrass, then do this. Use Titus chapter 3, 9. Tell them this. Say, hey, avoid. I avoid you because you're asking foolish questions. We're to avoid foolish questions and genealogies and contentions and strivings about the law for they're unprofitable and vain. Reprobates, atheists, they're all alike, even fake false Christians of the Laodicean church, they love to use the law. I had some of the wicked, most wicked people come at me and man, I was shocked. They knew Leviticus 29, four. They knew Leviticus 15, six. They knew Leviticus chapter, do you see what I'm saying? Don't get into those petty arguments. Say, listen, I'm, I'm going to avoid that because that's a foolish questions and strivings about the law. They're unprofitable and vain. If they really wanna know, then teach them about the dispensation of the law is now been fulfilled by Jesus Christ, and we are now under the dispensation of grace. Go ahead, show them, but that's it. Let them go if they want to just argue. Now, if you have someone who's a bully or in theological criticism and danger, they're actually sowing false doctrine. We have to rebuke them sharply. Yes, like that's why I'm always going after your like your Jack Hibbs, your Emeritus Fadis and all this. It's like someone said, leave them alone. No, 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 they work overtime. Do you know they're pumping out stuff every hour, two hours? I mean, once I saw that there were, the, I think the, this person, all they do is just boom, boom, propaganda, propaganda, propaganda. They're working for the devil overtime. So we have to rebuke them sharply. We, that, that, that they may be sound in faith, but we, but guess what? They'll reject it. They'll just keep going deeper and deeper, and then they'll be turned over to a reprobate mind. Now, 
We also have to tell these people what reaches a point. We have to let them know. Listen, the little G God of this world blinded their minds. They can't see it. They won't see it. Guess what? They're done. And then give them John chapter 8, 42 through 47, which is what Jesus told the Pharisees. Hey, I told you the truth. The reason you can't see the truth is because the truth is not in you. You're like your daddy, the devil. I heard one pastor say, never tell someone they're their father, the devil. No, um, yeah, I sure will there, Billy Bob, pastor, wherever you are. And uh, John chapter 10, 25 through 28, Jesus is saying, hey, if you're my sheep, if you belong to me, you're going to hear my voice. If you're not my sheep, you're never going to understand or follow me. You're going to go run after someone else, another false doctor. And then, of course, Acts 3, 9. Tell them, look, repent. Turn your life around, man. I'm moving on. All right, I'll close it here. Thank you. Even so, come, Lord Jesus. Amen. Maranatha.